Hello and welcome to the Care It Out Sleep Show, a podcast for tired parents who are searching for a bit more sleep in the caring way. I'm your host, Kerry Secker, infant sleep consultant, founder of my unique sleep approach, Care It Out, and your caring sleep supporter. I really hope you'll join me on my mission to get small to settle night's sleep without the tears, training, or techniques. I love talking about sleep and I can't wait to share my sleep subjects with you. My approach to getting you more sleep is simple, straightforward, but above all, it's got to make sense and feel best for you. Ready to get more sleep? Then let's get started. Hello and welcome to the Carrot Out Sleep Show. You are listening to your host, Kerry Secker, founder of Carrot Out, infant sleep consultant, I'm on a mission to get you and your small a set of night sleep that is training or techniques. Whether this is the first time you've delved into one of my, my podcasts or whether you are a seasoned sleep stalker and you've listened to every single out there, I'm really fat welcome and I really hope you find this this podcast episode useful, informative and reassuring because that's always my intention behind each and every single one. And today on the show I am going to be talking to Greer, founder of Nature and Nature Neuroscience, I knew I was going to do that, Greer from Nature Neuroscience, <laughs> and she's also an infant sleep educator, neuroscientist, and doula. Hello, Greer, how are you? Hi, Carrie, I'm good. It's so nice to speak with you today. It's so good to speak to you, Greer. We've spoken um, a couple of times before, haven't we? And every time I talk to you, I just le- I just love it. I've, I've learned so much from you, and I just know that our listeners are going to get something out of it as well. Yeah, absolutely. I think so lovely that we've connected. Thank goodness for Instagram and our shared interests because we're, you know, we, we might not meet for many years, but we're developing a friendship and it's so, yeah. it's so nice. Sleep geeks. <laughs> yeah. I yeah. love anything to do with sleep. And I have to say that is in a very, very um, impressive intro there for you. So you're a, let me get this right. You're a neuroscientist, infant sleep educator and a doula. Yes, that is right. I started a lot, my career <laughs> a long, yeah, a long time ago doing um, research in in laboratories and um, mostly focused on early life experience and and mental health. So how our earliest experiences and our earliest relationships form most of our emotional brain and how that goes on to influence you know, you name it once we grow up. So, you know, cognition, emotional intelligence, self-regulation, relationships, success at work, success at school, you know, all the all the things that we want for ourselves and for our children and things that we wish, you know, we could give everybody. We know now there's so much research that that's all formed in the first few years of life, which is both very cool and can be intimidating, but um, I think, you know, once we have a full understanding of it, that we don't have to be, nothing has to be perfect um, or or harsh or, you know, strict or anything like that, um, it can be a really empowering message. And, and yeah, and that's kind of my mission is to take all this neuroscience research and bring it to families and in, in a lot of different ways. That's to make that I am behind that mission. I'm a girl on a mission too, and I think it's such an important one because, as as we know, brain development it's linked to so much. You've just gone through lots of reasons there, but it can also. I'm particularly interested. The whole brain, fast like people, brain fascinates me completely. But what I'm really interested in, I'm most interested, is how the brain can impact sleep and bedtime behaviour. And um, yeah, just all of that. So many questions and so many things I want to ask ask you. I don't, I don't even know where to start. There's so much. But let's start, <laughs> let's start at the beginning. So tell us about Nurture Neuroscience. When did you set that up? So, yeah. So at, at the end of my time um, doing research, um, I did a postdoc and I was an assistant professor at Columbia University. I decided, you know, I actually had this kind of, passion to bring science to to families for a long time but close to the end it like really got you know the voice got really loud in my head like this is urgent this information needs to get out there so um so yeah so i created nurture neuroscience um as sort of um 
a way to 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 translate the research. And my first um, my first kind of way to do that was to be trained as a birth and postpartum doula. Mm-hmm. And I trained with a company called Babo Mia, which I now actually work with. Um, and and then I just like got out there. So I started working with you know tons of families, um, helping people prepare for pregnancy for during throughout their pregnancy for birth when they brought their baby home, um, and uh, as a postpartum doula as well in the first three months. And and at, along the way, I could you know emotionally support families and also educate, do a lot of education. Um, and then right away, sleep was like the biggest thing. I was like, okay, yeah. Cool. <laughs> it's everything. Yeah. People were like, oh yeah, great. I couldn't do all these things to like help my baby's brain, but sleep, sleep, sleep. And in the beginning I was like, oh, sleep's so, I don't know. It's so emotional for people. It's so controversial in some ways. I was like, I don't know if this is something I want to go get into and then it just I I just you know after a few months it was just you know inevitable like I had to I had to get into sleep it was um you know it's meeting people's needs like people there's a huge lack of information about sleep about normal sleep um and and that's yeah so soon soon after the doula training then I kind of just read you know everything about sleep I know I had studied sleep um as a scientist and, and pu- I've published on it as well, but um, marrying the theory with the practice was like a whole other endeavor. Mm-hmm. Um, so I got into that as well. And um, other things I do with nurture neuroscience is teaching. So I do, I hold workshops for families. Um, I am teaching other people about how to educate people about infant sleep with Babo Mia. And my my real big dream is to write a book. So that was like kind of, yeah. I know. I know. It's going to be, I'm so excited for when it happens one day. And I go through like, you know, times where I'm like, so it's going to happen. And then it's just, I start working on it. It's overwhelming. But I'm getting there. That's it's like my goal. Yeah. Yeah. That's the goal. So, yeah. So the way my work looks now is, um, I I had a baby uh, 18 months ago, and since then, my work started to look a lot differently. And instead of being in people's homes, um, I'm doing a lot of consultations and video conferencing sessions and that kind of stuff um, all across the spectrum. A lot of sleep lately. Yeah. 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 I think sleep is the, I definitely see this in my practice, it is the number one subject. I think it's up there with baby poop. And, um, yeah, I think baby poop, sleep, it's just, it's just, it's so important. And there is a lot of talk around sleep. And I think, I think, I I think I remember, I found you on Instagram and I remember scrolling as you do, you get into your scroll hole and I just stopped and I was like, yes, I love this page. Like everything just, it just resonated with so much. We're very, 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 very different backgrounds, completely different things. But something we're both sleep geeks, and something really resonated with me. I love that, and I completely agree with you that talking um, parenting in itself, I think, is very personal, and especially when it comes to sleep. So parenting, without if you take even if you're getting sleep, just parenting on its own is a very personal thing. I don't yeah. believe there's a wrong way to do it. So it's impossible to to get it wrong, so to speak. Um, yeah. But it can be very emotive especially when it comes to, to sleep because we yeah. seem to be split in so many different camps of what's what what's right, what's wrong. It, it can be so confusing, even mm-hmm. more so when you're sleep deprived. The seeing you, seeing your Instagram and talking and hearing you talk about what's normal sleep and how the brain, I was literally blown away. It's amazing. If any, I'll put the, um, the link to Instagram in the show notes after as if you're listening and you don't follow uh, Nurture Neuroscience highly recommend it it's normalizing infant sleep and I think we need more people doing that yeah and I recently tried to start sharing my own experiences um with my child about his sleep which I hadn't been doing in the beginning and just because I was seeing so much uh so much influence online of other people talking about how they were using sleep training and I was like I don't 
you know, there's the Beyond Sleep Training Project, which ha- which is great. But other than that, and you have to be a member of that, I don't see anybody really online talking about how they're uh, working with normal infant sleep and what that looks like. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's that's something I'm I'm starting to share more and more about as well. Yeah. I definitely talk about like and one of my biggest messages is that there's no right or wrong way to do it. It's impossible if it's working for you as well. I'm not gonna stop sharing that message. It's completely natural and normal for for parents, babies to wake up and have feeds and needs at night time. Um, and then within that that there's a spectrum. I'm also a massive believer if things aren't working for you. Um then there's support out there. And my approach, it's never about putting them to, to sleep through because actually I'm going to ask one of these questions um, for you in a minute. Um, but I believe that they get there in their own time. We can't teach or train them to do that. That just happens when they're biologically capable of not needing a feed at night time and it looks different for everybody. I think yeah. there are people out there that talk about it. It's just incredibly rare, um, incredibly rare. And I think the noise from... Um, and it's really important here. I'm not anti anything. My, my my whole ethos is that parents are always the experts. There's, you know, if you I'm not anti anything, if you feel that that sleep training or doing something like that works for your family, then absolutely crack on with that. But I think it's also really important that parents know what is natural, what's normal, and yeah. there's another way of doing something if you don't want to go down the traditional sleep uh, sleep training or techniques. Yeah, absolutely. We talk about informed consent a lot, and that. I don't think people have it because I don't think they know that there's another option. And if you know, if you have all the information and decide you make whatever decision is great for you. And I truly don't judge, have any judgment or anything to say about anyone's choices, but I do want to get it out there that there is, that there are other ways. Cause I don't think people know that. Yeah. Um, and also be there for people who don't, who don't choose the sleep training. Yeah. Uh, I- I think that's really important. We need to shout louder, Greer. You need to write that book. I know. I shout know. louder. There's so much, so much noise out there in the parenting arena, especially when it's sleep. Yes. One of the questions yes. that I had, and you don't know if it gets to the answer, but I would love to know. One of my questions was, do you use your practice um, with your own with your own child? And did that check? Did your um, did it change when you became a parent was it what you expected if that makes sense yeah you know a lot of it was what I expected I think the biggest thing that changed becoming a parent was to completely release any judgment um I always had that intention but I think somewhere in my mind um I was like oh this way is probably better than this way but um, obviously, I would in my practice never, never judge anyone, but it was still kind of there in my head a little bit. Once I became a parent, I was like, seriously, whatever works for people, yeah, you do that. Yeah, um, that was the biggest lesson um, in terms of everything baby related. Like, you know, whatever people do, you know, it's it's great if that's working, you know, for their family, and I truly believe that. Like, fu- I feel like my whole being believes that now yeah Um, oh that's lovely (laughs) I think that's so important because that really I'm not a parent and I'm very very honest and upfront about that so I can't talk about it from that experience I can just talk about it from years working with a nanny working with families my practice but that's I think that's lovely because I think that's such an important message to get out that if it's working for you all as well yes for sure definitely for sure yeah and that can, like I mean there's so much guilt that like that people can have like for every single step of parenting and you know even actually yeah even recently I was like no screen time like I'm not, my son's not seeing any screen time and now we're home all the time so he yeah. is and I'm like that this is what I need this is what we need this is like working for us and you know that's not judge it that's it's it's the way it is yeah Uh, it's hard not to judge though isn't it I think it must be hard not to let that guilt go it is it's really it's definitely an active practice for sure any Uh, for parents oh sorry go on 
Oh, no, continue. Um, any tips for her? That comes up a lot. I hear that so much. I feel guilty. I'm co-sleeping. I feel guilty feeding them to sleep. I feel guilty. I'm rocking. I feel guilty. They're not putting themselves to sleep independently. Yeah. Any tips around that feel? Well, you know what? I kind of think, and this isn't my idea, but someone, I can't remember even where I heard it, but basically the idea is like, let's pretend you were taking care of your baby, raising your baby on a, on a deserted island. Um, how would you take care of them? And if no one was there to watch you or judge you, how would you feel? Um, oh. Kind of like that. Um, Cause I think a lot of the, a lot of the worries and the judgments are like, Oh, if people find out about this thing I'm doing, they're going to think I'm weak or yeah. you know, permissive or, you know, all these things, because that kind of taps into that, you know, idea that we all have that, we shouldn't be giving meeting all of baby's needs and that that yeah that is they're manipulating us or they're asking for too much and all this kind of stuff but um i would say that's not true that babies do have you know genuine needs for connection and comfort um and our bodies know that and our brains know that and our our parent brain gets like completely transformed during pregnancy and early postpartum um whether you know you give birth to the baby or not, your your parent your parent brain transforms, and so you have these specialized new functions like listening for cries becomes amplified, your ability to be emotional and to sense emotional faces, and all these kinds of things become heightened. Um, your amygdala gets heightened, so you're you're more attuned to threats that might um, influence your child. And so you have all that going on. And then the baby's giving off all these cues like, I need you. I need help. I need comforting. I need these things. And so our biology, you know, is having this like very real conversation all the time that our culture is saying, no, don't do that. Don't do that. And so it's it's a very weird place for people to be in. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that's, you know, one of the biggest missions of my work is to is to let people know, like, you and your baby have your relationship going on and you need to trust that and not worry about what other people are going to say or judge and just be confident in that you have all the knowledge in yourself and the baby has all their knowledge to, to share oh, with you. I love that. Oh, I need, do you know what? I'm actually I'm very emotional at the moment. I don't know what is wrong with me, but that actually made me well up. It's, it's like, beautiful. It's beautiful. It's a really nice way of putting it. And there is so much, I, so much sleep, Jane, when it comes to sleep out there. Yeah. And what you just said there about how everything, that, that whole trust, um, trust is so hard, trust, and there's so much noise. Sometimes the more noise there is, we kind of disconnect from ourselves. We don't, we're not in tune with our instincts. There's mm-hmm. too much noise, too much chatter. And I'm always saying that you're, um, the, the parents are the experts everything you, it doesn't feel like it not always but everything you need is within you and yeah your baby they don't they're not born with a manual because that would be far too easy right if they came, came with a manual <laughs> um but they are the manual aka the bed boss and they're born naturally very good communicators and will tell us what they want when we're in tune and listening and we can drown out all the other noise yep Oh, that's beautiful. I completely, completely agree. And I always, I say that too. It's like the baby has, you don't need to read a single book. Your baby has all of the information. Yeah. That you They're need. the manual. <laughs> yeah, I've they got are. so much. Honestly, I think I could talk to you all day. So much I want to ask you. Let's start. Some of the, um, I put on Instagram, did anybody have any questions for you, Greer? And I got sent quite a few. Um, okay. Unfortunately, we're not going to go through all of them today because there were loads. I think I got sent over 100. It was insane. Oh. Um, but I've rounded up. Maybe we'll have to do a part two with you, Greer, in, a, in another couple of months. Yeah. Um, but I picked out the ones that came up time and time again. And I think the biggest one that I hear all the time, I definitely see this in practice, Harry, help me. My baby is not self-soothing or self-settling. And I think yeah. this would be, I would love to hear your thoughts on this. Yeah. So um, I did a, actually a recent Instagram post s- sort of on this. And we can only expect our babies to do things that their brains are capable of doing. Yeah. And we ask 
babies to self-settle, self-regulate um, at a very young age, and their brain is not actually not able to do this at yeah. all. So um, infancy, in my definition, lasts from from birth to age three. Mm-hmm. And the reason, one of the reasons for that, um, one of it is that there's just massive brain development, a million connections per second being made during that time, which is just wild. Um, but the other part is that the part of the brain called the prefrontal cortex, like our most higher order, most complex part of our brain, doesn't begin to form until age three. Right. And until that part of the brain can work, infants are not able to self-settle or self-soothe um, without co-regulation, which with, which means um, having an adult help them go from a heightened state of stress to a lower state of stress. That's my definition of self-soothing or self-regulation. Yeah. So if you see a baby who's, you know, who's fussing a little bit and they are, you know, able to to calm down and go back to sleep, it's likely that they just weren't, didn't have a very high level of stress to begin with. Yeah. Makes sense. Um, but if a baby does have a very high level of stress, if they're, you know, if they're experiencing a lot, they're crying a lot, queuing a lot, um, they are physically unable to bring that stress down. Yeah. And if we think about how we as adults self soothe and self regulate, we take deep breaths. Like we have our conscious mind to say like, okay, you're out of control. You're feeling stressed. Stop. Take a deep breath. Um, that's a very complicated mental program to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, babies don't have it. So we'll take a deep breath. We might put on calming music. We might make a cup of tea. We might call a friend because as adults, we also co-regulate. Don't forget that. Mm-hmm. We might cut a partner. Um, you know, we have all of our ways that we can do it. A baby doesn't have any of them. Um, Mm -hmm. and they need co-regulation. So they need an adult to come in. And once a baby does have contact with an adult who's has the intention of helping them calm down, that's how they can, can use their stress and calm down. So, so yeah, so there's some things, you know, we can do with babies that can help help buffer their stress like the scent of their caregiver is great you know if that's you know if they're sleeping alone like if that's in their room um sometimes like a tape of a caregiver singing a song or telling a story or something like that um can keep their stress low because like they're always seeking out that connection Mm -hmm. um so that's a big part of their stress but yeah they are not able to self-soothe or self-regulate so i mean i think something else entirely is going on when babies are taught to do that Mm -hmm. um it might look like they're doing their their self-regulating it look look like they're going from stress to sleeping alone um but that's just that's something else happening that's not them um learning how to do it themselves calming themselves down i just find it's i don't know just listen i could listen to you talk all day Greer, about sleep whatever you're talking about sleep like it's fascinating and we put so much pressure on our smalls to do things that even as adults we find difficult to do if i've had very rarely this happens like a really shizzy day in the office it's very rare i love my job you know um but I go home and I'm upset something happens. You, once you've lost control of your emotions, you do look for, to help to co-regulate, to go, go and, I go and talk to my husband. I might pour myself a glass of wine. I might phone a friend. Yeah. Um, yeah. We expect, let's just, I don't know, we've got this expectation that our smalls can do so much when we can't do it ourselves. And mm-hmm. um, I, 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 again, talk to my like this, but how have we got, how have we got to the point where a that happens but also b self-regulation is linked to sleep does that make sense Mm -hmm. yeah absolutely it's a really good question it's i mean honestly there's like a whole phd in like how did we get here (laughs) how did we get here great like it's how how did we get here it's it's so i mean we talk about like there's a bunch of like big sleep influencers that got us here so like the first was like Emmett Holt 
wrote a book in the early 1900s in the States talking about how babies should sleep alone and not be attended to at night. And then and Dr. Spock and Dr. Ferber, you know, they all had these huge platforms um, to talk about this. And people believe them because they have a medical degree yeah. and had it, you know, had big best selling books. And um, the other huge part of it is the way our culture is designed, the way that like our work is designed um, because it it works really well for the worker if a baby doesn't have needs at night mm. and you know i feel for i feel for families like we you know are lucky you know and especially in america if we have any parental leave um and and there's a lot of pressure for us to sleep at night and work all day yeah um and so babies have kind of you know, I want to, yeah, they're kind of suffering for it, right? They're kind of like forced to get into that schedule really quick. Yeah. Um, so that the family can can do what they need to do. Yeah. 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 So it's so interesting. Yeah. It's, it fascinates me, like how like I I try very very hard to steer away from using self settling and self soothing on my. I don't know what it is about the word soothe. Mm-hmm. Conjure up images have been soothing to me. It's like nails down a chalkboard to me. Yeah, and um, yeah. I always talk about self-regulation, and but to me, on my everybody's on my approach. If they've got to the point where they've lost control of their emotions, yeah. I call it losing their shears. I'm fairly sure that doesn't mean I don't need to explain what that looks like or sounds yeah. like. If you're small, does that, um, or we do it ourselves. And once you've yeah. got to that point. They are absolutely incapable of calming themselves down and they're just getting further and further away from sleep. So my yeah. whole approach is we can't always um prevent or um what's the word? Prevent or uh, preempt them losing control of their emotions because that's that's impossible. But where we can we try to avoid getting to that point in the first yeah. place. Otherwise it's just the end I call it the end of the sleep streak for everybody. Yeah, I love all your terms. They're so got nowhere to go. (laughs) Where do you go from that? It's like us. Yeah. Yeah. And the other thing to add that is another like one of my big messages is that when we do respond to infants and use co-regulation when they're younger, that actually is directly building self-regulation for the right time in brain development. Yeah. I mean, you can't see me. Oh, go on. Sorry, Greg. (laughs) Yeah, no, that's 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 the big thing. That's it. It's like once you, you know, put in, you know, those first few years of of of, you know, lending yourself, you lending your mature brain to your baby, you're basically teaching them how to self-regulate once those systems come online for them. And so sleep can be really I mean, it depends on the baby. Some babies, you know, are great and, you know, don't have tons of needs at nights but a lot of babies have a lot of needs at nights and so if you do spend a lot of time you know meeting those needs in the early days um you're gonna have a lot more sleep once they're you know three to six plus and they can really use self-regulation and actually self-soothe yeah yeah you can't see me i'm sorry i feel like i'm constantly interrupting you Greer, and that's not my intention at all it's just like i've just I'm so passionate about it and I'm literally you can't see me but I'm literally air pumping the air there when you said that yeah. because they do a double fit I'm like yay go Greer because there's so much connotation that if you meet your small's needs at night time your baby your infant your toddler you're meeting their needs at night time and you're helping them co-regulate that you're somehow soft spoiling giving in like they're very negative connotations with that when you said I was literally cheering <laughs> Yeah, right? Like, you know, anyone who kind of does any research into it n- finds out this information. It's not controversial. It's not, you know, um, a weird th- th- fringe theory kind of thing. It's like every bit of research into this points to this direction. And people in all different fields of research, they'll all converge with the same conclusions. Yeah, it just makes so much sense. And you are way more qualified than I am. Like you are a neuroscientist for goodness sake. Um, I'm actually, it's amazing. But yeah, yeah. Even 
you know, there's so much into it. And also following your instincts. I was, um, 20 years ago when I was at Nally College, I came out, I was 19, so over 20 years ago. And I was on my first job where I was taught, back then we were taught, because there was no other way. Berber, um, Ford was at their height of fashion. You know, I was taught to leave them to cry, eminently, you, you're the boss, it's, it's behaviour. And it just didn't feel right. But in, yeah. it's, instinctively, it doesn't feel right either, I think, for a lot of families. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think I hear that a lot. Like, a lot of people will come to me for sleep help after they have done one round of sleep training. And then, and then it, you know, either didn't last a long time or, you know, baby got sick or something. Yeah. Um, and they're like, I do not want to do that again. Yeah. Um, I think... Yeah. It's hard. It's really hard. And I think that's actually quite a, a common misconception is that, that baby, I don't believe you need to teach or train. That's a whole other podcast episode that you, you don't need to teach or train just to sleep. But there's quite a big myth or misconception out there that you do sleep training once and then that's it, it's done. You don't need to do it again. Um, yeah. Where that's not the case at all because sleep isn't linear. So every time um, they're unwell or you, it hits a bump, again can't prevent or um preempt that you you have to do it again and again and again it's i don't see that it's a long-term tool yeah i mean it also just is another bit of evidence suggesting that they're not actually learning self-soothing or self-regulation because as soon as you start responding again then they'll start signaling again ah. and if they really could self-settle or self-soothe then why wouldn't they just go back to doing that yeah they wouldn't signal. Do you yeah. buy in? I read something recently. I can't remember why I read it now. That some babies. Did I read that? That some babies are signal. Sig, I can't even say that. Some little ones. They they're signaler. How do you say that word? They signal? either signal. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Or that they don't. Does that make sense? Oh. So they had they but there were babies at night time that woke up and they woke up but they didn't um didn't give any signals that were awake babies that will always signal out i can't right. remember who it was but it was really interesting yeah i i would i would guess i haven't read that but i would guess that the ones who didn't signal weren't feeling stress like they were just you know awake they're like okay i'm not stressed out i don't need anyone i'm gonna just hang out here and then go back to sleep um or they were sleep and that's the same thing that happens with um some forms of sleep training yeah uh, they won't <sighs> signal but but yeah, there's, you know, there's so many temperaments that of babies that this is another huge area that pa parents don't know enough about or aren't prepared for. Yeah. So temperaments, so much genetic vulnerability. Yeah. Um, the nervous system can be so different between babies. Yeah. Um, so that sounds like that kind of um, finding to me. Yeah. I wish I could. My memory is terrible sometimes. I wish I remember where i saw it it was it was just it it was um it's a paper where did i see that i'll have a, i'll try and wrap my brains but it was like that all babies wake up the same amount of times at night time it's just mm -hmm. that some babies signal out some don't right yeah i mean that's what they find with in sleep training uh research that uh, once a baby is sleep trained they'll still wake up the same number of times um, but they're not signaling. They don't signal. Um, but this sounds like this is just sort of like looking at, you know, untrained sleep. Yeah. Um, yeah. That wouldn't be surprising to me either. And that also, you know, helps people's yeah. fear about, oh, waking is not healthy when it yeah. actually is. And it was more to do with the, I think I was doing research about how they go to sleep at bedtime. It was that it didn't impact how they went to sleep, wasn't really impacting whether they could get out at night time or not. It was really uh, interesting. Yeah, that's cool. All right, well, if you, if you remember, send that to me. I would really like to see <laughs> that. It really interesting. Or I've just completely dreamt it. We read too much. That's the yeah, problem. I'm constantly <laughs> reading. Um, one thing that you just, one question I did get sent, which you just touched on, is that why are some babies just more, more alert than others? Yeah, so there's, there. yeah, so that's sort of like the temperament question. So there's a lot of reasons there's a lot of like theories why we don't know like the full like mechanism to explain it, but we do know there's about four different temperaments that babies have. So one is 
um, easygoing. And so easygoing babies, you know, don't have big stress responses. They're fine meeting new people, going to new places. Um, they don't need to warm up too much. And that's kind of, they're probably born with, you know, um, a nervous system that would reflect that. And there's so many places where that could be affected. Um, I don't think we've like pinned down exactly where it is, but it's, you know, anywhere in the emotional system. It could be um, in the vagus nerve. There's like a bunch of different theories. Yeah. Um, I think about 40% of babies are easygoing. And this would be a baby that just like just falls asleep anywhere, um, can fall, you know, can be put down awake and drowsy. Um, you know, probably doesn't signal too much if they wake up in the middle of the night, that kind of stuff. And if they do, they might fuss and then not be too stressed and just be able to go back to sleep on their own. Um, and then there's high needs babies. So these were used to be called difficult babies. And these babies have a very sensitive nervous system. So they're, you know, they, they experience high levels of stress very easily. They're awake more, they're more difficult to settle. Um, it's hard for them to go into new situations, meet new people, all this kind of stuff. Um, it's also just um, good for parents to know that these this, this is all genetic and there's mm-hmm. no, you can't parent your way out of a temperament. Mm. So if your baby has one of these temperaments, that's their temperament and there's no amount of, you know, behavior modification or treating a baby a certain way that's going to change it like you need to you need to accept that um that it's possible yeah i mean that that's the way it is um and then the other temperaments oh i guess the other the third is a combination um oh no there's what there's one's a combination and the other the fourth is a little bit less needy than high needs so it would be slow to warm up i think is what Mm -hmm. it's called and I think that's about 15% of babies. And they also have, you know, a reactive nervous system, but not as high as, as a high needs high baby. Needs, yeah. 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 And so, yeah, there's a bunch of theories. Um, like I said, there's like, you know, a hundred genes I could think of that are candidates, you know, to lead to that. It's like the functioning of the amygdala, of the hippocampus. Um, and the vagus nerve is a new um, area that I'm starting to get really interested in. I haven't done enough reading in it, but polyvagal theory um might explain it and it's and the theory would be that some babies are born um with a strong vagal break so they're able to stop their stress quicker and more efficiently and other babies need to develop a vagal break over time and so they're once they do get stressed or they experience stress it's really really hard for them to to get back down to a relaxed yeah state. i definitely see that and i i see a lot of um i don't see very many easygoing babies on my practice I have to be honest it's yeah. all down the other end but i just think that they're all so different and i think that can become i've seen that from um from my days when i was a living nanny that and I actually see in my practice today where that can become a bit of a shock to parents to realize that every baby is completely different we've got this expectation yeah. that every baby is going to have the same needs the same whether that's sleep emotion, emotional physical needs as every other typical baby but it can come as a shock that they're i do believe that they're born with personality and temperament and it's different to everybody and it might not be the same temperament and personality as the parents yep yeah which and that's really... like a big challenge for parents uh-huh. is like if your temperament does it let's we call that like the mismatch mismatch um and if your temperament matches, great. Yeah, it's, that's very easy. If your temperament is a mismatch, it's still the parent's job to get the support and the coaching and the education they need to still meet their baby's needs. Yeah. Even if it's not a match. And I think that's such a good point. And I also see mostly high needs babies because those are the people who need the most help. Yeah. Uh, it's, Another really important thing for us to know is like that's, you know, we say only 10% are really high needs. And uh, let's say that that number is is, is accurate of the, of the general population. Um, that means that probably everyone else that parent knows doesn't have a high needs baby if it's one in 10 babies. Yeah. So let's say like, you know, a mom or a family has like, you know, 
four or five other people in their life that have babies right now and they're all easygoing or, you know, slow to warm up kind of babies, they're going to be they're going to think there's something wrong with their baby or there's something wrong with what they're doing as a parent that is, that's influencing the sleep. Mm -hmm. And we need to get this information out so people know that. And I also always say when I meet a family with this bait with a baby like this is sleep is the most unfair thing in the world. Infant sleep. It is so unfair. Yeah. Because it's just, easy for some people and it's just really re like one of the most challenging things for other families yeah uh, it's just not fair yeah completely agree with you Graham. I d definitely see that in my practice as well definitely um yeah. what was I going to say about seeing it, in, about, about seeing it in my practice? oh yeah I, I call that the only baby on the block like I think it's really important mm -hmm. that um I get so many, like, sent so many questions. Well, parents will ask me, is, is my baby normal? Is this normal? Is this natural that they're doing this? Is yeah. Or oh, I'll hear things like, my baby is the only one that's doing it. My baby is the only one that's not sleeping. Because yeah. Yeah, what, literally what you just said, um, and then, then they feel that they're the own, their uh, little one is the only baby on the block that's not sleeping or has high needs. Mm -hmm. It's just not the only baby that you can see. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And it's like, how are they supposed to know that? Like, or yeah. even believe you? you know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's hard. And then, and there's a lot of shame about it too. Like, it's like, oh, there's something wrong with my baby. There's something wrong with me. Yeah. Sort of thing. Um, it's a very, very, very hard situation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I've done the other thing that I really would like to change is like not just for the ba the people with high needs babies to know about this. Everyone needs to know about it because the people who have easygoing babies like look at these babies and they're like, what's going on with your baby? Yeah. Yeah. You know, Even, everyone needs to know this to support these people. Yeah. That's really resonated with me, Greer, actually, about talking about that more. I'm definitely going to try and talk about that a little bit more on Instagram, I think. I definitely talk about it once on because practice they are the parents and babies I see I need babies babies that find it very difficult to um sleep and yeah I'm definitely going to try and that's really resonating I'm going to try and talk about that on Instagram I think that's really important yeah it is and it's weird because when I was a nanny I never ever looked after easygoing babies ah. so, that, so that's all I ever knew um yeah as babies I don't like the word difficult baby I'm glad they changed it because yes it can be difficult yeah. for the parent but I think labeling a baby difficult at a really young age I'm not sure how oh, I feel yeah. about that <laughs> it's really hard and if unless the parent has a lot of support um yeah yeah they just it's just gonna be yeah really really hard really tough yeah 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 loads of other questions i'm going to whiz through them um yeah one question i had can and again this is i see this a lot parents will message me um worrying that their baby's lack of sleep is going to have an impact on their brain development or their learning development how true is yeah. that <laughs> yeah it's a huge question there was actually an, a a new paper a correlation paper released recently that babies who have a lot of sleep disturbances, um, have learning issues later in life. Very scary. But I will say waking frequently is a completely normal infant behavior. Like I said, not just infant child, like up to age six and on is like when, when children reliably are sleeping through the night. So it's a totally normal thing that babies will wake up. Um, yeah we know that it's 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 yeah so there's that um don't worry about it there you know isn't any like cause like causative that's not the right word there's no research that's showing a direct um a, it shows directly that waking up at night is going to lead to issues in cognition so the the new study that came out correlated it and we all and the, the problem with the correlated correlation is that we don't know um, if those if the babies who ended up with um, more difficult learning old, later on, if if the same 
factor was leading to both disrupted sleep and the learning. Yeah. Um, so that's just the correlation. Um, we don't have any evidence that, that waking is an issue. And the thing is, is there, there is almost nothing. I mean, there's a lot of things you can do to, to influence infant sleep in a positive way. Like, you know, the stuff that you and I work with with families, like, you know, nap, like, you know, good naps, sleep routines, um, making sleep a, a safe, comfortable, you know, thing to do. All those things are great. Those will all support the sleep that's going to happen. Yeah. But if you try to make a, if you try to teach a baby to sleep longer with something like sleep training, they're still going to wake up the same amount. We already mentioned that in this talk. So, oh, um, so the baby's, the baby's brain, you know, has, you know, it's circadian rhythms and it's sleep architecture that's going to unfold in the way it's going to unfold. And that does include waking and there's nothing we can do to change it other than support, you know, what's biologically normal. Um, and so waking is going to happen and that we, like I said, there is no evidence that it's going to lead to, to, to cognition issues yeah. later on. That's really, really reassuring, Greg, because I do get uh, on the weekly parents worrying that their lack of sleep um, is going to cause issues, like issues with them hitting their milestones or mm -hmm. um, hitting their development. Yeah, um, yeah. and that's I, not definitely not true. In fact, I would argue again that supporting infants and meeting their needs when they do wake up, that is what's going to help them meet their milestones. Yeah, that's going to support their later cognition because you're developing the emotional brain in those early years if the emotional brain feels safe and co-regulated in the early years that promotes cognition later on oh, i love that we need to get yeah. a post on insta i honestly i just love that so much because it really takes away all that, that that's that theme that's run through us talking together is that shame which i'm all about pushing that away um but it just takes, I think it just takes off that pressure and that shame because there's a lot of um, negative connotations and shame about meeting your little one's needs at night time. I think I mentioned it before, like the whole giving in, it's spoiling them. Um, yeah. I think it's definitely worth repeating that, like meeting your little one's emotional needs at night time. My whole approach is that, and like yours is very, like, is very, very similar that we always meet their need. If they're asking for support, we always meet them where they're at. And I also always meet them where they're at biologically, developmentally and physically as well. And that works for both ways, for parents um, and their smalls as well. And I think that's really, I think that's a really important message to get out that there's, it's not shameful. It's not spoiling them. It's not giving in if you're making their emotional needs. It doesn't make any yeah. less tiring, of course, um, but I think it's really important get that message out it it actually it's one of the things that makes me the most angry about the messaging that's out there because mm. it makes me f like both really sad and really angry that books like healthy sleep habits healthy child by mark weisbluth that book says if your baby's not sleeping a 12-hour stretch they're not healthy something like that um oh. it makes me so angry to think that that kind of information that's so false is in so many people's homes and that parents who are doing their absolute best, working so hard to support mm -hmm. their baby, are scared that their baby is not going to develop properly or they're doing something wrong. It makes me it makes me so upset. I can't right. even begin. It's just we need to get rid of that myth. Me too. So I I try really hard on that. I say that they we've just got this massive expectation that baby's going to wake up at the same time each day, nap at the same time to the dot, same length, um, lunchtime nap, same length, two hour unicorn. I call them a unicorn nap, two hour unicorn nap. Go to bed at seven at the same time every night and put in a twelve hour sleep shift. Everybody, what I call it, their bed bank. What we need in a twenty four hour period, the amount of sleep we need in a twenty four hour period, bed bank is different for everybody. Yeah. Yeah. And some yeah. babies do some babies do 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 a twelve hour sleep shift at night time without yeah. being um trained. I, I think sometimes it can work the other way. We assume that if they're doing that that the parent must have done something. I think that's important to talk about as well. Not always. Yeah. Some babies do do that. Naturally that's just them at their best. Living the best yeah, life. Absolutely.
And when you look at the research, um, there's a great paper that looked at infants, normal infant sleep. The range of normal is enormous. Yeah. Yeah. It's huge. So, like, we're talking about averages. There's babies that are going to be way up and way down from that average. It's just yeah. It's yeah. a huge range. Yeah. yeah. I always say some will need a little bit more sleep. Some might need a little bit less. But the best way to tell whether they're getting enough is look at them during the day. If they are on the whole, we all have our mm-hmm. moments. If they're on the whole, their milestones, they're bright, they're engaged, they've got energy, they're eating wellish most of the time. Chances are they're getting enough. Again, and that ties in with what you were saying. That, um, your baby, your small, will tell you. You know, they're the manual. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, last question. I promise, because. Again, talk to you all day and night. <laughs> this is a biggie. Can babies really manipulate us, Greer? <laughs> yeah. So that again, they need they need the brain parts to manipulate, and babies do not have them. Um, again, like you know, around again, I said around age three, that's when our our cortex, our prefrontal cortex, starts to develop, um, and that's when we can you know begin to start thinking about doing things like that um infant zero to three it's not possible um when an infant expresses a need or an emotion we need to meet them at, we need to meet their emotion um and respond to it and it doesn't matter why they're upset or distressed if they're expressing true distress um we need to meet it and you know some people are like oh well if my kid hurts themselves, then I'll make sure they're okay and give them comfort. But if I don't know why they're whining, if they're just whining and crying for no reason, like I don't pay attention to that because that's manipulating. Um, and that's that kind of stuff. Like we've left that behind in, you know, many, many decades ago. We now know that the emotional brain needs to be attended to in these early years in order to foster resilience and thriving and all these great things later on. So yes, the short answer is no, they can't manipulate. Um, We do need to meet their emotions and regulate them. Um, The other question people will say is like, but I know that they're testing me. Like I say, you can't do something. And then they try doing it over and over and over. Um, and that's a, actually a really normal learning behavior. I would not call that manipulation. I would call that um, learning social boundaries and learning rules in the world. Mm-hmm. Um, and for us as adults, that can sound annoying. Like it can feel annoying if, it, if a kid's doing the same thing over and over, but they're actually learning. Um, so, yeah, so that's so that's not I would not call that manipulating in that sense yeah. either. And in that case, we just still also need to stay regulated ourselves and gently guide them to what the rule is. You know, yeah. like, you know, don't throw something up, don't throw something off your chair. Um, yeah. and they might test it over and over, and we just need to, you know, teach them. Yeah. Um, but yeah, manipulating—it's that's the myth. Yeah, manipulation is a myth. There you go. That's yeah. a post and a half. It's- yeah. I think that's so important, so important that parents hear that message because there's so much out there. I definitely, um, I was trained that babies are manipulating us. That was the whole of my training 20 years ago. It took a while. Like I instinctively, I knew that at 19, without all the training I've done now, I, I instinctively I knew that be correct. But it's still hard to really shake that. I think it's ingrained. It's ingrained in us that they manipulate so I think that's such yeah. a, a powerful important message that parents need to hear yeah it really is ingrained and you know babies have a lot of needs and a lot of emotions <laughs> <laughs> it's I completely agree they're not always giving you that impression that they're not manipulating like, I totally understand that but it's yeah. just so refreshing to hear an expert say that that your baby cannot manipulate you yeah any more than yeah. they can co-regulate or go make themselves a drink. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I like exactly. That. Once they can, yeah. I was gonna make on a bad that joke. subject. I Did, sorry, say that again, Greg. <laughs> I said I was going to make a bad joke. But no, I go on. Do it. I was going to say until they can pour their own glass of wine. <laughs> <laughs> I will be definitely pouring myself a glass of wine tonight, I think. 
<laughs> I promise. Do babies wake up out of habit? Do you believe babies wake up out of habit? I don't. No. Yay! Um, <laughs> no, I do not. That's a, a, a yeah. That is a definitely another myth. Yeah, it's like oh, they're waking up for the cuddle, or they're waking up for the feed, um, or something like that. I think I think babies want to sleep well and sleep long as as much as they can um and if they wake up you know they have a lighter sleep than us they have lighter sh- uh, sleep cycles than us if they wake up and need help to get back to sleep that's that's very simply what's going on yeah again so refer- literally air pump when you answer that because we've been saying for ages that it's important because again you hear that all the time don't you you might you must get that in your practice. They're yeah. waking up out of habit. It's just a habit wake up. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, I, I personally don't believe they can wake up. Yeah. It's such and lovely hearing you say that. Night and not be bothered. Yeah, you know, I, kids. Are, I think children want that too. They're just not. They just don't d- develop the ability. Yeah. For months sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, I completely agree. Yeah. Greer, I honestly could talk to you day and night about sleep. Um, it's been fascinating. I've definitely learned something. Never stop learning. And I definitely feel the listeners um, to the show will find that really interesting. Where, if people want to find out more about nature neuroscience, if they want to find out more about um, the infancy education, where can they go and find you, Greer? Yeah, the best place to find me is on Instagram, and I'm Nurture Neuroscience Parenting on Instagram. Um, and if people are interested in being trained as a sleep educator, I lead a yearly training with a company called Babo Mia. Um, and the information for that's on my Instagram too. So it's all Amazing. in one place. What I will do as well, um, I'll put that all in the show notes as well. So if, you, if you're if you listening and you want to go find out more about Greer, more about her work at Nature Neuroscience and more about becoming an infancy educator, I'm going to be into that. Um, I'll put that all in the show notes for you as well. Greer, well, it's been you. absolutely fantastic having you. Um, I've really enjoyed talking to you. Any lot parting words of wisdom for our listeners? Oh my goodness. Um, <laughs> what's um, just love your babies. They're wonderful the way they are. We've got to love them. We don't want to, we don't need to change them. We just want to support them. That is so lovely. I completely agree. I think that's a lovely, lovely place to end the session. Um, it's been fabulous talking with you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Carrie. Take care. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much for listening to me, your host, Kerry Secker, on the Carrot Out Sleep Show. I really hope you found the podcast reassuring, informative, and a little bit fun. If you did, please don't forget to subscribe to the show below, and I'd be so grateful if you could leave me some fabulous feedback. I always love hearing from you, and one lucky listener will win lifetime access to my Bedtime Basics e-course every single month. My next podcast episode will be out in two weeks' time. But if you can't wait for more of my sleep shizzle, you can find me over on Instagram at Carrot Out Sleep Consultant. I update my sleep squares and speak sleep there on the daily. Big love and sleep solidarity to you all.